Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Pastor Fields here, and it's Wednesday evening, and we know what happens on Wednesday evening when we come together, joining together as God's people to go into the word of the Lord, and we go into his word so his word can go into us. Always happy to be with you among the people of God here at GRTDC and at Refuge Temple Annex in the Bronx, and to all of you who are far and near, who have been joining us every week. I say praise the Lord. And I'm so grateful for the Lord's greatness and his faithfulness towards us all. Before we begin, of course, as always, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful tonight, and we're so grateful. Yes, again, I say we're grateful for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and for you allowing us to come together again as your people, I pray that you would bless everyone that connects with us on tonight as we go into your holy word. Minister to our hearts and to our minds, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, of course, you know, we have been mandated as a church, uh, as individuals in the body of Christ, uh, to continue and to grow, and we've talked about it uh, within our different lessons week by week, talked about how we are to be holy and how we should stay in the truth, stay in the truth. And I know today truth is relative. Everybody has their own truth. You'll even hear it in conversations. I've even heard the saints say, uh, well, this is my truth. And we have to be careful with that and because if we just say it's my truth, then uh, what if your truth really isn't the truth? And the word of God says, according to Jesus, and this is what he says, and it's true, I am the truth. And as people of God, if we're going to really be in the truth, then we have to make sure that we stay in God's word, stay in the truth. Tonight... I'm in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, and I want to talk a little bit about the struggle, and, or I should say uh, the situation that Paul had with the church in Galatians, uh, and how in the midst of his own struggle, he was able to minister to them and admonish them to stay in the truth. And of course, just like then, today, there are those uh, who would admonish us as people of God or try to push us uh, to deviate or to walk away from, even to mix. Uh, in Paul's day, they, they were called Judaizers. And what they wanted to do uh, was to make the people of God or the children of God, those who had been born again, uh, to persuade or to make to, or even to compel to go back into the things of the law. Paul, Pastor Paul, of course, being under house arrest, hearing these words, writes them a letter in order to reconfirm them in the gospel and to make them think about what they were doing. Don't allow anyone to talk you out of the truth or to move you from where God has placed you. So uh, he talks to them about it. And I'm going to read the foundation scripture, the, our lesson scripture. This is where we're coming from. He says these words, Galatians 5 and 7. This is the foundation scripture. This is what he says. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? I'm going to read it again. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And my subject tonight, uh, for point of reference, the title of my lesson is What Went Wrong? What Went Wrong? And I'm sure it's something that was going through Paul's mind while he was ministering because they were taught in the truth, they were led into the truth, the truth was planted in them. And there were some who were backsliding and walking away, some who were giving up, some who said, all right, I'll mix this with that. Um, and one of the questions Paul would ask was, who did bewitch you? 
who was it that tricked you out of continuing in the truth? And this is what the church of God is supposed to be doing now. We're supposed to be continuing in the truth, not altering, not compromising, not changing, don't change anything. No. Paul would say to the same congregation, there's no other gospel, no other gospel. Say it with me, hashtag it, no other gospel. So we need to talk about this uh, because we know it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's a marvelous thing for us. Um, and when I think back how the Lord saved me, it, it's wonderful to be converted, to be saved, uh, and understand that a truly converted individual, uh, truly a person who is truly born again is going to be glad about their salvation, happy about sa their salvation, and it's not enough to get it. You have to hold on to it. And there are going to be struggles, there are going to be temptations, and there's going to be warfare. Yes, but we have to be determined to hold on to the truth. First Peter 1 and 23, uh, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, that thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 5 and 1, and I'm going somewhere. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1 and 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, uh, if you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost, you've given your life to Christ, all these scriptures uh, pertain to you. Those who have given up a world of sin, you heard the truth, and the truth has made you free. Don't give it up for anyone. Don't forsake it for anyone. And this was Paul's argument, don't give up the truth just because what you heard sounds good. Don't give up the truth just because uh, the people who are talking to you sound so convincing. The truth has made you free. Why should you go back from which you've come? Remember that song we used to sing, uh, I won't go back, I won't go back. My Lord's been good to me, Jesus has set me free, I used to hold the eye for a long time. I won't go back. I used to love to hear that song. Uh, it is, I have in my notes, it is inexpressibly sad when one who has been truly saved turns back for any reason, whether you've been tricked or whether you packed your bags and walked away from God. No, it's sad when you've been truly saved and all of a sudden you've turned back. I hear, I hear that scripture in my spirit now that says, how can you neglect so great a salvation? I want to take you to Acts 7 and 39. Um, Luke writes these words, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. They were delivered, and they turned back to Egypt. They went back to the things they had been delivered from. Proverbs 14 and 14. Listen, and, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it just like it is in the Bible. It says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. And I know there's, there's some saints that believe that it's impossible to backslide, but if it was impossible to backslide, the word backslider would not be in the Bible. God... God even takes time to say, I'm married to the backslider. Yeah, and it's, it's impossible. It is possible, I'm sorry, for you to be in the good place and then leave that good place to go back to the bad place God has delivered you from 
And when you leave the truth, when you walk away from what is true to hold on to a lie, you're on your way to making backwards momentum. As a matter of fact, if we go, if we go back, we'll be worse than we were when God first saved us. Stay in the truth, man of God, woman of God, child of God. Stay in the truth. Preach no other gospel. Live according to no other word or way. Uh, but it, it is sad when, when people backslide and they walk away. It's sad. Uh, if the church... If the church goes into a backslidden state after receiving all of this word and delivering power, shame on us. It's a shame for the church to become lukewarm. Can it be possible for the church to become lukewarm? Yes, it is. Revelation. 3 and 16. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. It is possible for church folk, for the body to come to a place also where you lose your first love, where you get so wrapped up in being busy until you forget what ministry is all about, when you forget what salvation is all about. You get so busy until you're not working uh, to please God, you're working to please man. And you have stepped out. Some people have stepped out of the faith, and they think they're still in the faith. Revelation 2 and 4, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And this is what he says. Hallelujah. This is what he says. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. Here's the Lord talking to one of the churches in Asia Minor, saying, you've lost your first love. You need to repent. You're not doing it for me anymore. You walked away from the truth. You're doing it for yourselves. You're doing it to please flesh. You're not doing anything for me. He says you need to repent. He's talking to the church. Repent. Do your first works over. Yes, remember from where you have fallen. Go back to the place you're supposed to be. Remember where you dropped off, where you fell off. Repent and do the first works or else, he said, I'm going to come quickly. I'm going to remove the candlestick. You'll have to have church without me. You'll have to sing in the choir without me. I won't be there. You can go to church all you want, but I won't be there because you've lost your first love. You don't even love me anymore. He's talking to the church. It's the tragedy to be out and out for Christ, to win all of these souls. We, we call ourselves earnest workers. I'm, I'm reading out of my notes and then turn away from the Lord to get this far and decide we don't want to be the church anymore. We don't want to be in the forefront anymore. And don't complain. Uh, when the sinners get up and decide, I want to get in front of the line where, and we've walked away from the truth because it's not popular anymore. Hold on to the word of God. Hold on to the truth. And this is what Paul is saying. Who bewitched you? Who tricked you out of holding on to the truth? They wanted the Galatian church to mix grace with the law. Have a little bit of this and that mix it with a little bit of that and Paul said oh no don't preach any other gospel don't add anything to it don't compromise with anything so but there were those in the Galatian church and I'll give you the date it was about uh, 56 AD when Paul writes this letter to the Galatians and they were turning aside some of them to false teaching false teaching now listen False teaching has two sides. There's that side that we always understand. Somebody gets up and starts preaching a lie and telling a lie. But the other side of the false teaching is when you just sit there and take it in and don't deny it. And don't deny it. You know the truth, right? And now you're listening to a lie and you won't deny it. You'll start, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And after a while, because you keep receiving it, because you keep allowing it to be poured into your spirit after a while you'll start compromising because you wouldn't deny it and this is Paul's issue with them turn aside from these false teachers right because some of them were, were 
were successful in pulling some of them, I should say, back into bondage. And God has done too much for us. He has invested too much in you, my brother, my sister, for you now to decide to compromise with the truth. Yes, yeah, so uh, listen to what uh, the Lord, he is conveying in the key verse uh, that we've read, our foundational scripture. He said, I want to know who hindered you that you would not obey the truth anymore, that you would walk away from the truth. What hindered you? And that's my question tonight to the body of Christ, to everyone, even to myself. If there's any hindrance, I don't want it anymore. I want to fulfill my purpose. I want to fulfill my purpose. That's it. I want to do what God tells me to do, even if people don't want to hear the truth. I want to know the truth. I want the truth in me. I want the truth to come out of me. I want to walk according to his truth, right? And I don't want anything else but the truth. And if people won't accept the truth, as long as I've given them the truth, and that should be how you feel. I want to be in the truth. I don't want to live a lie. I don't want to be in a lie. And I don't want lies poured into me. I want the truth of God. And I have no intention. And this should be everyone's confession and determination. I don't want to come out of what I know to be the truth. I want to stay in the truth. And it's a race. It's a race that we're running in. It's a race. And don't be detoured. Don't be detoured. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. This is what the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian congregation. And it's, listen, it's a challenge to everyone. It's a challenge to everyone. I don't care what the name of your church is. If you're in the truth, you're going to be challenged. And you got to stay in the race. Paul says, know ye not that they which run in the race run all, but one receiveth the prize. It's a race. He uses the metaphor in this writings in 1 Corinthians 9.24, it's a race. If I compare that to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience. Let us run with patience and the race that is set before us. So the key verse, the key verse that we read out of Galatian tells us plainly that there is a possibility, there is the propensity, the potential for us to be hindered, hindered. Listen, the commentator, a theologian by the name of Weymouth, uh, he is a theologian, biblical theologian. He translates Galatians 5 and 7 as the following. He says, who has got in the way of your obeying? Who has got in the way of your obeying? Who has got in the way of your obeying? Mm -hmm. a, a literal translation, and, and we don't really use this word anymore, uh, so it speaks to how old this commentary is. But uh, another translation he gives is, uh, who has jostled you? Who has jostled you? And here's another saying that's pretty old. I'm getting ready to show my age. Who has ruffled your feathers? Who has knocked you out of your box? And now all of a sudden you don't know what the truth is anymore and you're grabbing onto something that is not true. So we're going to talk about this. What, what went wrong? What has gone wrong? And, this, and, and I'm doing this so we can all do some soul searching uh, because uh, there are hindrances and, and there are things in our way, and there are some things, yes, only God can move. But there are some things we need to move. We need to roll away. We need to get rid of so we can walk in this truth. Walk in this truth without fear and without acting like we're embarrassed to be truth bearers, to stand on God's word, to live according to God's word. What hindered you? What hindered you, my brother, my sister, my preacher, my missionary, my deacon, child of God? What, hind what went wrong? You were running a good race, 
Paul says. You did run well. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you? Who cut you off? Kept you from obeying the truth? My God. So uh, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So uh, who hindered you? And, and here's the point that I'm trying to make. Was it the inconsistency of other believers that hindered you from professing faith and holding on to your faith? Was it others watching others mess up, watching others make mistakes? Because, you know, and you're using that as an excuse for yourself, not obeying the truth. And this is why I read that scripture. For even hereunto, to, hereunto I'm sorry, were ye called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So listen, when you feel, even if you, you have an issue with people who are supposed to be in leadership, that's not an excuse for you not to follow the truth. And say, oh, I'm not following. Because the problem, the problem here is then you put more stock in the person that's sitting in that chair than you do in the God that saved you. Don't do that. Do you look at other Christians, other believers, other leaders and follow their example? And, and you would say, people would say, yes, we should follow them. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't put me on no pedestal because I'm human just like you. Yes. You put them on a pedestal stool rather than you discovered that they're not as perfect as you felt that, you know, never mind the fact that you're not perfect either. But a leader is held, of course, to a higher standard. And Paul is saying, well, they're men just like you are. But Christ saved you. That man didn't save you. But did that hinder you? Looking at someone else's mistakes, then uh, you discovered that they weren't as perfect as you thought right and you and instead of holding on to Christ you you got all embellished in your disappointment and discouraged right uh, there's only one who we should really set up as an example and this is why Peter is saying follow his steps follow the steps of Christ he's that example follow the steps of Christ he's that example let's go to Hebrews Let's go to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Some of you can rattle this off without even looking at it. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And verse 2 is a clincher. Looking unto Jesus. So when people disappoint you, you should be looking unto Jesus. Don't use that as, as an excuse or let that be a hindrance to you obeying the truth. Because some of them, some of them, truth be told, were using the fact that the pastor's in jail as an excuse. Well, the pastor ain't here. Paul ain't here. And these people are here talking this stuff. Maybe I should follow them. And, and uh, the truth is you should be following the steps of Christ. You should be following the steps of Christ. Don't use my trial or don't use her trial. Don't use her problem for you to step out of the truth. That's not an excuse. That's not good enough. I'm sorry. Looking under Jesus. Looking under Jesus. Hashtag that looking. Hashtag looking unto Jesus. Who is the author and finisher of our faith who the, for the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross despising the shame is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So it is most essential to look off away from oneself. It's essential for us to look away from self. I'm going to say it again. It's essential, people of God. In order to stay in truth, we have to look away from self. We have to look away from circumstances, so to speak and from other people. Don't get so embellished in what the people, the people, the people. Follow the steps of Christ. Follow the steps 
of Christ. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So tonight is a challenge for everybody. It's a challenge tonight. What hinder you? <laughs> what hindered you? Was it persecution? Was it a misunderstanding or opposition? Mm -hmm. oh. Let's go to John, St. John 16 and 22. Behold, the hour come of the is now come that ye shall be scattered. Every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So when you have misunderstandings and when you, when you are uh, going through, uh, and, and this is Jesus talking to them, you're going to be scattered. You're going to see some things. Uh, and, I'm, and Jesus is saying, I'm getting ready to go through some rough stuff. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to go through some stuff that is so heavy that some of you are going to look at me and shake your head and say, uh. I'm, and he said, they're going to leave me. Jesus said, they're going to leave me. They're going to walk away from me. But I'm not alone. And that's what you need to understand. Many people accepted Christ, right? And uh, everybody who has accepted Christ, anybody that's real for Christ, anybody that really loves the Lord, you're going to have, you're going to face misunderstandings, opposition, trial, tribulation, and sometimes it's going to come from people in your own family. It's going to come from people you love a whole lot and looked up to a whole lot. It's going to be from people you depended on. They're going to, and it happens, right? Uh, and the test is going to be so severe at times, right? Um, that discouragement will knock on your door. Yes, it will. Uh, and you'll even be tempted to, to give up everything. I've been there. A lot of you have been there. Tell the truth, I can't take this stuff no more. And you were so discouraged, you felt like throwing up your hands. And, and Paul is ministering to them from house arrest. I'm imprisoned. And I want to take time to encourage you. And I know, don't be discouraged. And, and, and I know it's easier said than done. But you're not by yourself. These light afflictions that we have is nothing when you compare it to the glory that shall be revealed. My God, I'm starting to feel this. Hallelujah. I'm starting to feel this. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 11 and 12. This is Jesus talking again. He said, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. This is part of it. You're going to go through trial and tribulation. You're going to have trial. Your salvation is going to be questioned and challenged. People are going to challenge what you believe. They're going to look at you and say, that ain't true. That's a mess, but you got to know the truth for your self and when you find the truth keep the truth hold on to the truth and don't let nobody pull you away from the truth you're going to have trials you're going to have tribulation yes you are yes you are you're going to be threatened you're going to be threatened the lord was threatened with stones john 5 59 they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed away. Jesus was in church. They picked up a rock and tried to kill him. Yes, they did. He got out of there. They took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. Now, this is Jesus. He was giving them the word, giving them the truth, and they didn't like what they heard. So they started picking up rocks. They Listen, I'll read it again. Then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, which means he was in the temple, giving them the truth. And they didn't like what he heard. And they picked up stones to try to get rid of him. Here we are. I'm in the word of God. Uh, I'm in God's word. So what is hindering you? You're going to have you're going to have problems. Not only did they pick up rocks, they put a crown of thorns on his head. 
put a crown of thorns on his head. John 19, 1 and 3. I don't want to go too fast. I want to take my time and work this. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown, plated rather, a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Hmm. And said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. They mocked him. Mm -hmm. Luke 23, 33 through 37. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right and the other on the left. Then Jesus uh, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him. He's dying for them, and they're deriding him. They're, they're rebuking him. They're laughing at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Mm -hmm. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, if you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. Superscription was also written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. So uh, he's doing something for them. He is doing something for us. He is doing something to benefit them. He didn't have to die for us, but he's suffering. He's going through. He's mocked. They crucified him, right? Um, and, and the apostles of old taught the saints of God, it is a privilege to go through when you're going through, when you're, when you're suffering for the cause of Christ. Look at all that Jesus went through for you. So don't allow even the problem, don't even allow the pain to hinder you from holding on to the truth. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. He was, he was crucified. He was mocked. He was spit on. Yes, he was. I want to take you to Philippians 1 and 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him. <laughs> listen, listen to what Paul says to Philippians. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad we're here because so many people think salvation is all about, is all about uh, getting into uh, prosperity and, and having stuff. Uh, but the nitty-gritty of salvation and holding on to the truth, there's a price that we have to pay for holding on to the truth because people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to accept the truth. They don't like people that walk in truth, right? But listen to what Paul says to the Philippian church. He says, for unto you, I'm in Philippians 2, 1 and 29. I'm sorry, Philippians 1 and 29. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Wow. He, he, I'm, let me read it one more time. I want to read that. Philippians 1 and 29. It's not only given, in the, it's given to you on, on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, not just to say, oh, I believe the Lord, but also to suffer for his sake. Remember what Jesus said, if any man follow me, let him first take up his cross and then follow me. He didn't say, if anybody follow me, I'll give him a million dollars. If anybody follow me, I'll give you a new boat. You can have a yacht. If any man follow me, you'll have a mansion. If any man follow me, he'll be the richest man on the, any man follow me, I'll give you a brand new Mercedes. He didn't say none of that. He said, if any man follow me, let him first deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Now, that's the truth. So the truth about the truth is when you walk in the truth, when you have the truth, you're going to go through some things, but don't let it hinder you from holding on to that truth. And the saints of God, some of them are being led away from the truth. Don't let anybody beguile you. You were bewitched. Don't let any man spoil you with vain philosophies. Don't get caught up in the rudiments of the world. Don't do that. Hold on to the truth. So was it, was it the persecution? 
Was it the misunderstanding? Was it the opposition that hindered you from holding on to the truth? It's easier for me to just walk away from the truth than to go through what I got to go through to hold on. But the apostles would teach you. They tell you right away, oh, man, it's an honor to suffer for Christ. Look at all that he went through for us. And you complaining and you walking away, you're giving up. Uh, you're you're going to compromise everything just because? No. What hindered you? What was it that hindered you? What was it that hindered you from obeying the truth? Was it, was it a severe trial? Was it a, a severe trial or sorrow? Uh, I'm going to take you to Hebrews. And the Hebrew congregation was struggling with the fact that we have trials and tribulations. And some of them were walking, literally leaving the faith. Um, and in their hearts, their minds, because because this book talks about better things. And the writer of Hebrews is letting them know no matter how much you complain about the trial and the tribulation, you're in a better place. That's the truth. You're in the truth. You're in the truth. You're holding on. Don't walk away from the truth because you're having trials and tribulations in your life. Hebrews 12 and 6. For whom the Lord loveth. Yes. He is in, and he uses the word chasten. Because some of us are going through because we're being chastened of the Lord. We're being molded. We're being shaped. We're being strengthened. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourge every son he received. So even if there wasn't a trial or tribulation, the Lord is going to work on you. You're his workmanship. The Lord is going to take you through some things because he wants to test your faith. He wants to test you. The first thing the Lord does, one of the first things the Lord does, and, and this is real talk, one of the first things God does once you have decided that I'm going to follow Christ Right, and you got up and saying, I'm going to follow God, I'm going to trust God until I die, and I'm going to give myself totally and completely. And this is, this is what the Word of God says. He's saying, the writer of Hebrews, he said, present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, right? And I want you to give yourself, God wants us to give ourselves entirely over to him. And once you make up your mind, that I'm going to live for God. I'm going to hold on to God. You know what you said? I don't care what the people say. I don't care what they do. And as soon as they say something about you, you are, oh, I'm going to know you can't do that. No, you got to be willing. If you said, I'm going to give myself entirely over to the Lord, one of the first things that will happen to you is you're going to go through some tests. You're going to have some trials. The trying of your faith worketh patience but you, you go through that test the Lord wants to see did did she really mean the song she was singing I surrender all did you really mean that and you're going to be tested did you really mean it all you said I'm gonna I'm gonna give everything did you really mean it because understand this is a pilgrimage that we're taking and as we take this journey you're going to have tests you're going to have trials and you're going to have chastisement yes He's going to work on you because we don't always do the right thing. And while we're going, because it's God's job, if you would give yourself totally to him, it's his job as a parent, as a father, to keep us in line. Just like just he is the chief shepherd. And when the shepherd sees the sheep going in the wrong direction, he takes the staff. That's what the staff part is. He takes the staff and he spanks the sheep a little bit or he'll take the rod and that hook part and pull them back in there. So he could stay in line, right? But the first thing he does, he'll have, he'll take you through that test. He'll chastise you, just like you train a child. The word of God trains us. Our shepherd trains us. God trains us. He'll take you through a test and a trial. Uh, he allows testings. I have in my notes and trials to beset us, so we can learn how to cast our cares on Him. Psalm fifty-five. Love this psalm. 22nd verse, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Hallelujah. Malachi 3 and 3. My God. 
in the book of Malachi, he talks about refinement. He shall, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. The Levites were praisers. Uh, and I don't know who I'm talking to, but perhaps what you're going through now, uh, he's trying to purify your praise. And you're getting all set and you don't want to be in, I don't want to do this no more. I don't want to stay in the truth. And you start compromising because, and God is just refining you. He shall purge you like gold and silver that you may, listen, that you may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Sometimes we're going through because uh, the Lord wants to deepen your faith. He wants to strengthen your faith. 1 Peter 1 and 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried in the fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Let me look. Have you ever read Luke, the seventh chapter, and around the 23rd verse? Uh, because people are so easily offended in this journey that we're taking. And, and because they're offended, they, they throw down the truth or they walk away the truth from the truth or they give up. Because um, some, some people have, have stopped uh, walking this apostolic walk or left the word because uh, they were offended. And, and listen, because people equip, equate the building or that particular church as the body of the entire body of Christ. And you can go to anybody's church. You can go to any church you want to go to. And, but people get offended and they don't just leave that particular congregation. They have walked away from God. Now they're sitting in, in something else or they just stopped going to church altogether. They've just given up on everything. They've been hindered because they were offended. But listen, Jesus says it in here in the book of Luke chapter 7 verse 23 and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me stop taking everything so personal she got a long the journey is too long you think this is something you're going to go through some more things don't be so so wrapped up in and all you can talk about is I've been offended I've been offended I've been offended I've been offended hold on to the truth and walk in God he said, blessed is he who has been, he said, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Blessed is he. Hmm. Blessed is he. And, and here is a rebuttal. I, I want to go back to this because um, John the Baptist was offended. Now, there's nobody, there's, there was, John the Baptist was a bad man, but now he's sitting in jail. And he's all in his feelings now, right? Now he introduces Jesus and he's, and he's a little in his feelings now because he's in jail and, and uh, um, John, is, John says, I don't know if he was being sarcastic. I'm gonna, I'll wait till I get to heaven to ask him. He's, he's, he says, uh, is he the one or should we look for another? Is, is, he, is he really the one? And, and you know, I think he was in his feelings. He was offended. He's in, he's in prison. And Jesus is out there preaching and doing his thing now. Uh, and Jesus answers him and says, go, go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor, the gospel is being preached. And blessed is he who... So ever shall not be offended in me. Wow. Don't let anything hinder you from holding on to the truth. Not even your situation. Not even the offense. So what hindered you? I'm, I'm here in the fourth category of my notes. And in this area, I'm, I'm dealing with, <clears throat> excuse me, the world pulling on you. Because when you get saved... Right, There's, there are all kinds of teachings out there. There's all kinds of worldly things uh, pulling at the people of God. And we gotta be truthful. There's a whole lot of stuff that looks good, sounds good, right? Uh, and it's pulling at the people of God. Is it the world? 
Is it the world that is hindering you from obeying the truth? 1 John 2.15 here it is. I mean, I'm, we're going old school now. Love not the world. Right? If, it, if we was having old school church, I'd stand up and say, read. And the reader would stand up and say, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I want to say to you just plainly, straight up as I can. As a man of God, as an oracle of God, we cannot love God and love the world at the same time. It's impossible for us to love the world and love God at the same time. We're in the world, we're not of the world. So some of us have to decide, are we going to be in, in God or are we going to be in the world? Is that hindering you, the pull of the world? Perhaps some of them. Oh, if I go back, I don't have to, I don't have to pray so much if I mix this with that. I, um, I don't really have to do anything that I don't want to do. I, could, or I, could, I should say I could still do some of the things I used to do. If, if, no, you can't, you can't have it both ways. You're either in God or you're in the world. So was it that? Let's, let's look at Matthew, uh, chapter 6, verse 24. Book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24. This is Jesus talking a bit again. He says, no man can serve two masters. Hear me. Hear me what I say. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't be in church loving the world. You, we, got, we got people in church hating the church and loving the world, sitting in the house of God, wishing they was in the world. No, Jesus said you either love one and hate the other. You can't love both of them. He says you got you to gotta hold on to the one and despise the other. If I were you, I'd hold on to God. And start singing, you can have this whole wide world, but I'll take Jesus for mine. He said, you can't serve God and mammon. Wow. You can't serve God and the world at the same time. And there's some folks who are trying to do that, and it's a hindrance. You cannot be in and out at the same time. You have to, it's either one or the other. Listen, um, the Bible in 2 Timothy mentions someone by the name of Demas. And this was his trouble. He wanted to be in and out at the same time. I'm going to take you to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. And this is Paul talking. He's been going through some things. And uh, he starts talking about a brother by the name of Demas. Demas has forsaken me. Demas was a brother in the church, you know, and, and Pastor Paul d depended upon him. You know, I'm under house arrest. I need somebody. I need somebody to help help Pastor Timothy out. He's a, he's a young preacher, and, I, and I, I need to be able to depend on some folks who I consider to be seasoned in holiness and holding on to the truth. And Paul names him. He's, he says, Demas. Demas forsook me, and this, is, and this is what happened. He said, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens, to Galatia, right? Titus under Dalmatia. He said, Demas forsook me. And he's, you know, Paul is by himself and he's talking about all these people, but he gives the reason for Demas leaving. He said, Demas fell in love with the world. He chose the world over God. Now, Demas is in the truth. He heard the gospel. Paul preached to him. He was baptized in Jesus' name. Yes, he was. If Paul had anything to do with it, he was a born-again believer, baptized in Jesus' name, following the apostolic teaching. But Demas forsook me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Went into this went into this Greek city. Thessalonica was a booming town. And there was a whole lot of Greek god worship. I'll say it just like that. 
in Thessalonica and he left. It's like me, it's like me after all these years in the truth and preaching the gospel, I get up and you all are looking for me to be preaching on Sunday morning and I got up and went to Las Vegas, right? And, and I'm, now I'm sitting at the gambling table. I said, oh, I'm, I'm tired. I got tired of holding on to the truth. Let me go see if I could win some of this money. That's what Demas did. So is it the pull of the world? Is it the, you want, you want money? You want a bigger house and you feel like, oh, maybe I can make more progress if I get away from them holiness folk. No. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? I think it was a very powerful question for Pastor Paul to ask the church, ye did run well, who did hinder you? And I think that was his way of saying, who are you going to blame it on? You got all this truth. You've heard the word. You've been saved and delivered. And you decide to allow somebody to talk. Listen, nobody can really talk you out of something you don't want to be talked out of. I've, I've been in situations and, and traveling where somebody was begging for money, begging for money. And, and it didn't matter what they said or how they looked up, you know, me and pouting and tears in their eyes. I didn't give them any money, and it, and it didn't mean that I'm not a giver and I'm not compassionate. Uh, my mama taught me that when you're out in, in public, you don't go into your pocket and pull cash out. I didn't do that. I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to give you anything. And as soon as I said, well, I'm not going to give you no money, but if you're hungry, I got to catch a flight, but that we're right. There's a food court right over there. Let's go over there. No, I don't, I don't want to. They're not supposed to be there soliciting anyway, but, but listen, but listen to this, but listen, um, you cannot love the world. I just had a senior moment, forgive me, and love God at the same time. The next thing I need to talk to you about um, that hinders us is neglect of fellowship with God is a neglect with fellowship with God. It's a hindrance when you neglect fellowship with God. And this is an excellent point. And when I remember the last point, I'll come back to it. I told you I was having a senior moment. When you neglect fellowship with God, and I need to say this, and I think what threw me off was I'm talking and looking at my notes at the same time. But in the midst of this COVID and this COVID uh, virus, this COVID-19 virus, a lot of the saints are home. A lot of saints are home and things have changed, yes. And this is what I need to say to you as a pastor because, because things have changed and we used to just come to church and everybody's in the building and now some people can't come to the building, some are in the building, but it's not like it used to be. But some people prefer and, it, and it's my feeling that if it got to a place where everybody can just come back into the building, some people will prefer to stay home and watch service. Watch the service. Listen to what I'm saying. Content with just watching service and not participate in, in worship. And there are some, and, and, and let's be real, since we've been stuck in the house, we've been eating more than we've been praying, some of us. Right? We've been watching TV more than we've been reading our Bible because we're home. Do not forsake, do not forsake fellowship with the Lord. Do not forsake fellowship with the Lord. It's a hindrance. John 15 and 4. John 15 and 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me abide in me in other words if i said it a different way it says remain in me remain in me it means to stay put in me now what i'm talking about is beyond the building beyond the building beyond the building so don't i don't want you to think that you you can't do nothing really unless you come into the building that's not true 
but don't allow the fact that you're in the house so much be a hindrance to your fellowship with God. He says, remain in me, stay put, right? Uh, because some folks, because they're home uh, all the time or they're, they're sitting and they're not really in the word like they used to be or in prayer like they used to be, uh, they're, they're in a place where they're, they're shaky. And don't, don't let this COVID in-house stuff uh, hinder your fellowship with the Lord. Remain in Christ, right? And because some people are, are slipping, some people are weakened because they're neglecting private prayer. And I'm just going to be real because when we were in the building, you didn't come to prayer service. When, when everybody was coming to church and the pastor or the leader called prayer service, a lot of the saints didn't come to prayer. So I'm, I'm not weak-minded where I would think that if you weren't coming to the house for prayer when you had an opportunity to come to the church and pray. And now that you're home with all this TV and all this food, you may be tempted not to pray as you should. And it's not an indictment. I'm just speaking to you as a pastor. Don't allow all that to hinder you from fellowship with God. If you neglect prayer, private prayer, I'm talking to you now, Ralph. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Your home, find a prayer place. You're, in, you're shut in, don't let it be an excuse. Find a place you can pray. Continue in the truth. Continue into that relationship and fellowship with God. But thou, when that, this is Jesus talking, when you pray, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray unto thy father, which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Yes, and when we're able to come back to the house of God, your attendance, don't, don't, don't neglect coming to the house. Don't do that. Hebrews 10, you know where I'm going. Some of you are going there before me. 1025, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Any way we can come together as God's people and today, just like we're doing Bible study virtually, don't forsake it. Any way you can make connection with other people of God, make that connection in prayer, in worship. We just had an AUC conference, right? Others are having conventions, others are having prayer service. Um, Yesterday, I had prayer with the mothers. Me and the mothers was on the line, on the Zoom line, praying for each other and so forth. Any way you can connect, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves with the people of God. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians. I'm, I'm almost through. Chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, and I read that verse because as a consequence of not connecting with the people of God, not having a consistent uh, and an ongoing prayer, uh, and don't use uh, any excuses. Keep that relationship, keep that fellowship going. Uh, if you don't do it, you'll start slipping away spiritually. You'll start weakening spiritually. Uh, and, and Paul is saying, we all with open face beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we should be progressing. This is why I read it. No matter what's happening, even this COVID-19, that should not be a hindrance to us either. You can still go from glory to glory, even in the midst of this. Thank you, Father. We can still grow even in the midst of this. We can still prosper spiritually even in the midst of this. What did hinder you from obeying the truth? What hindered you? I'm almost through. What hindered you? Was it willful disobedience? Yeah, was it willful? What is willful disobedience? When you know to do the right thing and you do the wrong thing. 
you know. It's willful. You want to do the wrong thing. You prefer the wrong thing over the right thing. Does that really happen? Yeah, it does. It does. I'm, I'm going to read out of Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 13. Therefore, now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. You want to escape judgment? And I know I read in the Old Testament, but if we as members of the body of Christ, if we want to escape judgment, we must stay in the truth. Right? And here in the Old Testament, the prophet is saying you need to consider your ways, change your ways, amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord and obey the voice of the Lord. It's not the first time Israel would be spoken to. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Why does God have to keep coming to the, his own children saying, make up your mind, choose you this day, amend your ways, get right, repent, all of these things because he has something in store for us and we should not be going through judgment for sin because we have been called out, we have been chosen out. But here, and I can pull up many other scriptures, that God's own children, hearken to my voice, obey my voice, and it will repent of me the evil that I have pronounced against you. He's talking to his own children. Oh, yes, he is. He's talking to his own children because they're doing the wrong thing because they want to do the wrong thing. In the book of Amos, Amos is telling them you can't walk with God, you can't walk with Jehovah and walk with the world at the same time. You can't be a child of God and keep agreeing with the sins and the things of the world. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Is it possible? Uh, listen, I have in my notes, it is of little use to think to talk or even pray about uh, being in God's will or doing the things of God or receiving the things of God if you won't reform your ways. It's, 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 I don't even know the word to say. It's ridiculous for us to sit in this church, right, and want to be blessed and want to do this and want to have this uh, and when we have an opportunity to repent and change our ways, because sometimes, um, you know, sometimes it, it is needful for us, it is needful for us to come to a place where we are examining ourselves and humbling ourselves so God doesn't have to come along and do it for us. But there are times where the Lord, the Lord looks at us and says, you know to do right. It's like, like a... a, a a parent talking to a child and the child looks at them and says, I didn't mean to do it. And you know good and well, you meant to do what you meant to do. You, that's why you did it. And this is what God is saying. Some of y'all are doing stuff and you know it's wrong and it's a hindrance. It's willful disobedience. Reform your ways. And here's a message for, for everybody in the church. There's some stuff we need to fix. Things we need to change. Yes, we do. If we, if we intend to hold on to the things of God, there's some stuff that has to happen among the people of God. We form our ways. In, in other words, there has to be, and this is what uh, it's really saying, there must be some drastic dealing with anything and everything that is wrong. Yes, there has to be a drastic dealing, and this is soul searching. This is examining yourself. You got to get rid of it. God said to Abraham, get rid of the bondwoman. Make, make it, the blessing is not there. Get rid of, put it out. Sorry, sweetheart, you got to go. Listen, I have in my notes, dealing with willful disobedience, is there a wrong friendship? Are you entanglement? There goes that word, Jada Smith. Is, is there a wrong friendship? Amos 3 and 3, can two walk together if they're not in agreement? How can two rather walk together if they're not in agreement? What fellowship does light have with darkness? Is there an unequal yoke? 2 Corinthians 6.14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion have light with darkness. I wish I could spend time on that one. I already feel some of y'all tightening up, but I wish I could spend, maybe I'll come back to it. Uh, is it a secret sin? Is it something that you're, you've hidden and you refuse to let go of? Remember Achan in the book of Joshua and he brought his household man by man and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. When they found out it was Achan, they had to get rid of him. And this is what I'm saying to everybody, including myself. When you find out what it is, get rid of it. Don't let it be a hindrance. Don't step into a place of willful disobedience. Is, is it an impurity in your life? Isaiah chapter 52, verse 11. Depart ye, depart. Ye go out from thence, touch not the unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Is it an unforgiving spirit? Are you singing, I'm on my way to heaven and I'm so glad, but you refuse to forgive? Matthew 18, 21, 22. This is what it says, Matthew 18, 21, 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Also says, if you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven. Uh, is it an unfulfilled vow? You making all these vows and you don't intend to keep them? Uh, you make promises and you don't intend to keep it to the Lord. Deuteronomy 23, 21. 23, 21. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. If you're not going to do it, don't say it. Don't tell God I'm going to do it. And then don't do it. It's a hindrance. Because it means that you're willfully now, because you know you made the promise, but you walked away from it and you refused to do it. He said, don't slack to pay that vow, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. When you tell God you're going to do something and you don't do it, it's sin for you not to do it. You lie to him. Proverbs 28 and 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Yes. Let's go to uh, Psalm 66 and 18. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I refuse to let go of my sins, the Lord will not hear me. But the Lord, he says, you know, well, he hears the sinner's prayer. I'm, I'm talking about the person that's been in God and now you've decided to willfully sin he said, if you hold on, if you regard, if, it, if that sin means more to you than God, he said, I won't even pay attention to you. You don't really mean it. You don't really mean it. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, but verily God, he's heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. So David says, I have sense enough to know that if I don't let go of this thing, if I keep doing what God tells me not to do, he's not going to do what I need him to do for me. It's going to hinder me. It's going to hinder me from being blessed. It's going to hinder me from doing what God has me to do. Paul says to the Galatian church, you did run well, but who did hinder you? Hinder you. Who did hinder you? And I'm going to go back to our foundation scripture. Thank you, Lord. He said, you ran well who hindered you that you would not obey the truth. Who hindered you? What hindered you? Hebrews 12 and 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, where they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape. If we return, sorry, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. My God. He's talking about Jesus the mediator. He's the mediator of the new covenant. Covenant, I should say. 
He says, the blood has been sprinkled as a sacrifice for your sins. The word has been preached to you. Don't refuse it. Don't push it back. And don't fight against the person that's bringing you the truth. He said, if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. And he's telling them, if you know the truth, don't walk away from it. And I'm back in Hebrews now because Hebrews were walking away from the truth because they said, I didn't sign up for all of this stuff. And the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen. All of this stuff was done for you. Your sins have been forgiven. You have been washed in the blood of the lamb. You have been delivered. And you're going to walk away from this because you're going through. Don't let the problem, the persecution, don't let none of that hinder you from holding on to the truth. I wish I could teach it tonight like I feel it in my spirit. Um, and I have in my notes... Uh, if you're willing and honest before the Lord mm -hmm, and you long to come to him and I'm, I'm doing this and I'm getting ready to wind down if you're really serious about this child of God and I'm talking to those of you who are, are in a place now and you know in your heart and mind that you have allowed things you have allowed things to hinder you you have allowed things to keep you from doing the things that God has put in you to do, you're hindered from obeying the truth. If you're honest tonight and you're, and you're willing to come before the Lord and come back to him, I'm, I'm talking to you, yes. I don't care what church you go to, who your pastor is. I don't care if you sing in the choir, right? And this is the good thing about virtual. Ain't nobody looking at you. There's nobody watching you come to the altar. Ain't nobody watching you come down the aisle. Ain't nobody giggling at you. You're in the comfort of your own home. It's just you, me, and Jesus. If you're willing to be honest and come back to him. Listen, this is what I have in my notes. If you're willing to do that, God will put his finger on the thing that's hindering your life. He'll put his finger on the thing that's hindering your life. He'll put a finger on the thing that's hindering your life. I'm going to read a scripture to you. Um, Hebrews. I'm sorry, John. 2 and 5. And I'm reading this because whatever God tells you to do, whatever God has spoken in your life for you to do, I'm saying this to you, you need to obey it. Obey it. Don't let it be a replay of of the same thing that pulled you out before, the, th the same thing that hindered you from being committed before. Don't replay none of that. None of that. Come back to the Lord and do whatever he tells you to do. I'm going to take you to a familiar passage of scripture, John 2 and 5. This is the mother of Jesus. Remember, uh, he's at the, at the wedding and uh, they need wine. They've run out of wine. Uh, and Jesus, Jesus' mother starts bragging on him. Uh, my son can do it. My son can handle it. If there's a problem, if you, if you need some new wine, uh, Jesus, Jesus can do it for you. Uh, just do whatever he tells you to do. You've run out of wine. <laughs> You've run out of joy. You've run out of strength. And Jesus' mother says, uh, unto the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And that's, that's a powerful word. Uh, Mary said to them, we're sitting at this wedding, there's no wine. The life, the life has been sucked out of the party. And, and she says, uh, go tell Jesus. Uh, go tell Jesus. And, and uh, some things have hindered you, whether it was the trial, whether it was the persecution, whether you say it's the people got on my nerves, whether it's, let me say it, the pastor got on my nerves, whether it's I'm tired of that choir director, whatever, whatever it is, Paul, Paul is sitting in prison saying you ran well, who did hinder you? Don't you, you have, did you forget you have a soul? Did you forget that the Lord saved you and brought you out of sin? Who bewitched you? 
Who did you let steal your joy? Who did you let uh, come to a place where you're taking the problems that you're having out on the one that saved you? And now you're forsaking the truth. And this is what the Judaizers came. You just, just mix this with that. Everything they were doing uh, that was according to righteousness and their salvation, the Judaizers were criticizing it, criticizing their truth, criticizing their life of holiness. And Paul is saying, listen, who bewitched you? And I'm saying as a man of God, if you're willing, people of God, if we are willing from the pulpit to the door, if we are willing to come back to God the way that he wants to. You want to know if we come back to God and do what he tells us to do, miracles will break forth among the people of God. Signs and wonders will break out. God will put his finger on the things that's hindering us if we do what Mary said that we should do. John 2 and 5, his mother saith to the servants, to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And this is one of the problems in the church is hindering us because we don't want to do everything Jesus tells us to do. Nope. I'm, we may as well tell the truth. We've gotten to a place now in, in, in church from the pulpit to the door where we want to do what we want to do. And the moment we only do what we want to do, we're no longer in the truth. We have stepped away. But if we're willing to come back, if we're willing to do it line upon line, precept upon precept, if we're willing to run this race and lay aside the weights and the sin and say, yes, Lord, if we're willing to get back in line, I, because I hear the cry. I'm hearing the cry in my spirit. I hear the cry in the streets. I hear the cry every time I watch the news. I hear the cry when I'm in prayer. Where are my people? Where's the church? Where y'all at? Come back to me. Walk in truth. Pull the line. So people can see, that I see my power. So I can reveal my power. So I can reveal my power. He'll put his finger on the things that are hindering us. Right? If we obey his word. I'm going to read it again. His mother said to the servants. Whatsoever he says unto you. Do it. I'm getting ready to close. And I want you to know. Um, the only life. The only life that is glorifying to God pleasing to others and really satisfying to ourselves can be a life that is filled with obedience to God. And I hope you understand me and I hope uh, you understood what I was saying on tonight and I wish I could get it out the way that I feel it in my spirit. But the only way, the only way that our life is going to be a life that glorifies God is that we live a life that is complete in obedience to the truth, to the truth, to the truth, to the Lord Jesus. He is the truth. Don't forsake him. John 14 and 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. I am the truth. We can't keep doing stuff and leaving Jesus out. I am the truth. And the life, no man comes unto the Father but by me. We have to stay in the truth. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Stay in the truth so the truth can come out of you. Stay in his word. Don't do anything outside of his word. Right? If it doesn't measure up to his word, if it's not in line with his word, leave it alone. Stay in the truth. Anything else would be a hindrance. I don't know how you feel, but I really want to make it in. I really, I really want to make it into heaven. I really want to be pleasing in the Lord's sight. And I really want to hold on to 
the truth of God. I really want, I want the Lord to do something with these hindrances. The things that I'm not able to do, take it away. And the things that I need to get rid of, Lord, <laughs> I need to move it out of the way so I can be all that you want me to be. And this was Paul's, this was Paul's concern. Maybe it was a rebuke, yes, and we need to be rebuked rebuked at times as people of God. He wants to know, you, you were doing well. You were running good. I was getting good reports. Folks getting baptized, and, but you let this, this false teaching, this, you let people come in to, their, to your life and, and try to talk you away from the truth. And some people accepted it. Some people walked away from it. We read out of Hebrews. Some people backslid. Some people left. They didn't just leave the building. They left the truth and went back from where God brought them out of. And we've got to stand up. We've got to recognize that we're too close now to turn away from the truth. I hope you've gotten something out of this. I hope you were able to understand what I've delivered on tonight. What went wrong? What went wrong? Jesus spoke to one of the churches in Asia Minor and said, go back to the place where you fell off. <laughs> go back. It's like, it's like somebody giving you direction. You got lost, right? You were supposed to make a turn right there and you're lost now. And the person you're asking direction from is saying, turn around and go back where you went off the road. And then you'll be going in the right direction. That was Jesus. Jesus was saying that to them. Go back from where you fell off. Repent. Get it together. And get on the right track. And I believe that's what the Lord is saying to his church today. What went wrong? Go back to where you fell off. Let's get back on the right road. Stop dealing with all these things that are hindering us as a people, as individuals, as a church. And let's follow the leading of Christ. If you were listening to me tonight, if you heard me tonight, if you were able to understand me tonight, if you receive the word tonight, this word is for everybody, including me. Let's start examining ourselves. Lord, if you see anything in me that shouldn't be, take it away. Create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. Lord, give me the courage to hold on to the truth, even when others are trying to pull me away, even when others are not understanding, even, even if I'm in the midst of trial and tribulation. Help me to hold on to the truth no matter what we can't be the church if we're not willing to walk in the truth did you not know that if the church walks away from the truth we're not church anymore we're something else but we won't be the church of God nope we gotta be determined to follow Jesus and to do what he said I wanna pray for you if you need prayer, put your name in that comment box. Write your name. Yes, write your name there, and we'll be praying for you. We'll put you on the prayer list. If you desire to be baptized in Jesus' name, yes, send us a, an email, admin at grtdc, and someone from the staff will get back from to you, I should say. You can even send your prayer request if you want to do it that way. Uh, someone on the staff will get back to you. But if you put your name in the comment section, immediately someone in the staff will answer you back and they'll talk to you back. Uh, they'll type back to you, they'll message back to you, and, and we'll get the ball rolling even sooner. I believe in the power of prayer. This is a time of reconciliation and restoring, coming back to the things of God. Everybody has to be right before God if we're going to make it in. Yes, it's true. 
everyone from the pulpit to the door. Want to be baptized? Send us that request. Want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Send it. Admin at GRTDC. Want to give you time to do it before we pray. Now reach out and touch that screen. Squeeze that smartphone and let's talk to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this time of fellowship. And it's my prayer that what you've given me to share on tonight has been a help to someone, that you have touched someone's heart, that we were able to, to reach them right where they are. Your word does that. It doesn't matter what we're going through. Your word can find us right there. I pray for every person that's connected to this class on tonight. For your healing and your deliverance, for whatever is needed in their life, I pray that you do it for them, Lord. In the name of Jesus, help us to be that church we're supposed to be. Help us not to be so easily pulled, tossed to and fro with any wind of doctrine. Help us, oh God, to have the tenacity to hold on to the truth, not our truth, but your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you want to plant a seed in this ministry, you can do that. You can do that. Follow the instructions, won't you? Uh, Brother Craig will put that on the screen and follow those instructions and plant a seed in this ministry. Be a blessing to us. We want to thank you so much for how you have been contributing, how you have been blessing the ministry. It's because of you that we're able to do what we do. And those of you in the Bronx, Refuge Temple Annex, you may give via Givelify. All right, we're getting ready to close. And you know what I'm going to say. There are three things that I need you to do between now and the next time we meet. Be careful, be prayerful, and yes, that's right, be holy. The Lord bless you. We'll see you again on next week.